Hello, everyone, and welcome back. For those of you who listened to some of our prior webinars, in the past, we focused um, entirely on our acquisitions team and our acquisitions process. This entire webinar is going to be about investment management, uh, which essentially is once you buy an asset, how do you execute the business plan? And what's really important um, to understand with investment management is whether you're judging a manager like us, we're going to do that management for you, um, or you're trying to do it yourself, all this applies. Um, you need to have an understanding going in. You need to execute a business plan. You need to benchmark that business plan. And you need to have an honest conversation. That either your manager or you yourself are doing this at the highest possible level. That's how you're going to get the best risk-adjusted returns. And so today, um, I have the pleasure of doing this webinar with Mark Turner, who is our Managing Director of Investment Management. Mark's been with us for over five years. Um, and prior to that, 20 years in the industry, including 10 years at Equity Office. Um, obviously, at Origin, he's been focusing entirely on multifamily and has become a true expert of operations. He runs a team of four people, um, and I work very closely with his team as well. Um, and I, I, I believe that we're um, probably among the best um, operator, uh, operators in the country. Um, and I believe that our returns sort of speak to that. So we're excited to share that uh, process with you today. Um, and so with that, Mark, welcome. I, I think that um, you probably have taken a different strategy on your hair than I have. Um, you've been, did you take the risk of the haircut, the, the homegrown self haircut? I, I did, I did. Uh, you know, the, the home haircut decision, a uh, bit of a risk prior to an on-screen appearance, but uh, it's paying off in, in terms of maintenance. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm okay I, with I've been truly socially distanced. I haven't had a haircut <laughs> in three months. Um, I, I put a lot of water in it and believe me, it'll look really crazy in about um, two hours, but um, let's jump right in. Um, I was remiss on, on two, two levels. One, I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name is David Shear. I'm co-CEO of Origin Investments. Um, I oversee both Mark's team, which is the investment management team, executing business plans across the country and multifamily. And then also I, I oversee um, our acquisitions team that are spread across the country as well and live locally in their markets. Um, my business partner, Mike Leposcope, manages all um, company level operations. Um, so his team is actually quite a bit larger than mine. Um, let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to kind of start with a story, Mark, and you can respond. Okay. Um, okay. I don't normally get involved in capital raising. That's Michael's team and Michael's purview, my partner. But um, in this case, I had a, a close family friend who's retired and she was um, considering investing in one of our funds. And I took the call and I spoke to her. This is very recent, um, a couple months ago. And um, she said that she was really excited about investing with us, um, but she was also considering um, investing in um, a four flat or a six flat in central Florida, um, understanding that she actually lives in Greece, uh, but she had a person that was gonna help find the investment and manage it for her. Um, this is not uncommon um, in the multifamily space and in the real estate space, people feel a sense of familiarity because they live in multifamily, they consume real estate. And so they, they feel like they can do these things. Um, I, I would be hard pressed if she was considering buying a biotech company and um, going into domain she didn't understand and valuing it and running it from Greece. Yeah. That probably wouldn't happen. Um, but in multifamily, we see that it happens a lot. Um, how do you feel about that, Mark? And what would be some of the advice you would, you would give in that instance? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you think of multifamily uh, real estate as being a passive investment, that, that's really a mis mis misperception. And these assets don't run themselves. It's, it's, it's hard to be good at managing the multi, uh, multifamily property. And, and especially now, as renters have a lot of choices and standing out from the crowd, really requires a significant commitment of resources and creative ideas um, to, to best market and retain uh, residents, market to and retain those residents. Yeah, and, and it's not just about executing the business plan, it's also how do you know you're winning, right? So in the last 10 years, the market's been very, very strong in multifamily and um, you could operate a multifamily building at not a great, uh, with a great strategy, great execution, and still you, you'd have done okay, 
But if you were benchmarking against other better operators, maybe you would see that your 10% return is not quite as good as the 20% down the street. Um, how do you do that for us? Like, how do we benchmark? Because you know, obviously we're trying to achieve our business plan and our budgets, but we're also trying to see if we're doing better than others. Yeah, and you know, we analyze um, a tremendous amount of data in terms of not only how are we performing from an occupancy and, and rent uh, level with respect to um, the properties that we compete with on an everyday basis and, and a little broader market view, but we're really focused on also uh, benchmarking ourselves against um, the elements of their strategy they're offering to residents, which, you know, we, we put into three general categories. Uh, there's a virtual, there's a service, and there's physical. And those are the three categories that we built our playbook around. And when we benchmark ourselves um, against others to say, how are we doing? And you know, sometimes we learn we're not doing as well. Other times we learn that we've been early adopters of, of innovation and know that we should continue to push that because that's a differentiator. That's a critical part of what we do as an investment management team every day is we're constantly comparing ourselves to what the competition's doing. And that takes not only access to data, but it also takes effort in terms of going out and evaluating their websites, their physical property, how they provide services to tenants, how they create a lifestyle experience. And, and uh, that's something we do kind of on a daily and weekly basis. Yeah. So each of our properties have a write-up, a one-page write-up that's the summation of um, dozens and dozens of data points. Um, and Mark's team and myself are going over those on a weekly basis. And it's not just that property, it's that property relative to its benchmark set. So how is our website, how is our ratings, you know, our apartment ratings, how is it physically doing? How is the leasing process? You know, we do our own lease shopping where we call up and act like we're renters and we also hire third party firms to do that. And, but then we also do it with the competitive set and we want to make sure that we're winning at all these operational aspects because your net operating income at the end of the day is nothing more but the summation of all these inputs. And if you're winning at every input level, you're going to be winning at the, the net operating income level as well. Um, Mark, let's back up and talk a little bit about um, acquisitions because yeah. this is critical too. Um, the acquisition team, um, their job is to find the best risk adjusted um, opportunities in the market at the best pricing. And they're bringing them to committee and they have formal write-ups. There are dozens and dozens of pages long with, with models, um, mathematical models. And each model is no better than the inputs into the model. You know, the whole, the old uh, adage, garbage in, garbage out. The key to these models is what's the defensibility of the inputs. And, and that's where your team comes in because it's critical to understand the market the competitive set to understand, can we achieve these levels of rents? Can we achieve these levels of cost savings? You know, every single input has to be scrutinized and ultimately approved by you. Yeah, that's right. And we have accountability for executing on that business plan. And, you know, it's a collaborative effort, um, not only focusing and analyzing all those data points and, 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 stress testing them. You know, what could go wrong? What if a major corporation, major uh, job uh, driver leaves that particular location um, or that market? Um, what if um, we aren't able to increase rents because income levels sort of bumping up on a ceiling of sort of affordability? You know, we have to ask ourselves those questions of sort of what can go wrong and dig through a lot of data and really get down on the ground um, understanding sort of the, the relative strengths and weaknesses of, of our, the potential acquisition property relative to its competitive set. But really most importantly, all that detail comes down to really concentrating on maximizing the revenue potential of each property. And we want to identify, you know, ways we can create longer term value in the asset. Um, and so we're asking ourselves the question, also, where can we improve this property? And that's both physically and operationally to differentiate ourselves from the competitors and, and create value relative to what you know, we're paying for the asset. Yeah. And so when we ultimately approve these 
fields. It's a very competitive process because if you think about it, every real estate private equity firm and manager like, like ourselves, we have a finite amount of capital and the deal officers, the acquisition teams are vying for the best investable idea. And it's Mark's job and candidly my job and my partner Michael's job to make sure that we're, we're allocating those into the best spaces, right? So, so now we invest into the asset and, and Mark, what's, what's that Mike Tyson quote? Oh yeah, um, you know everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. I think is how it goes. Yeah, and and you know that's appropriate. I mean, look, occasionally um, our business plans are pretty accurate, so the inputs in the market are pretty accurate, and occasionally they're conservative. And there are other times where you come in and the environment changes, right? And COVID's a great example. The stuff that we underwrote in Q4 of last year. Obviously, it's not as relevant when there's this, this massive shift in the demand set and the ability to pay. And it's our job, based on our experience in risk management, to manage through that process. And, and I, again, I would, I would say I'm not against do-it-yourself investors at all. Um, I, I think that if people have the expertise and, and importantly, if they want to spend the amount of time that's necessary to do things right, um, but you have to value your time. Right. So if you say, well, look, I did just as well myself. OK, um, we, we've returned 15 to 25 percent on every investment we've had over the last 10 years. You might have done that too yourself, but when you did it with us, you, you didn't spend any time. You, you, you actually did the things you wanted to do. Right. So and the, these are the things that you, you should think about um, when you're when you're trying to formulate is a do I have the expertise? Um, and am I willing to dedicate the time to do things at, at the best level? Um, Mark, let's, let's jump into um, some tangible um, case studies and, and we can make it a little bit more visual, but um, let's start with Fletcher and we'll take them through some of the operations that, that um, we believe yielded um, some significant results and perhaps people watching could model some of you know, their own investment decisions based on that. Yeah, so... Uh... Fletcher was a um, multifamily, 220 unit multifamily uh, project that we acquired in uh, suburban Denver back in 2008. And when we had acquired um, the asset, you know, part of that acquisition process was identifying those ways to create value. And, and we had noted major enhancements to the common areas and exterior curb appeal that were needed but also got very excited about how we could come in with our playbook and focus on you know, all three areas. Their virtual presence, their website, wasn't really articulating to residents um, what it was like to live here, um, partially because it wasn't so great to live there. Um, their physical needed all these improvements that we've talked about, both exterior and in interior in the units. And then also, um, mm -hmm from a service level that we thought that there was a real lack of creating community, a sense of community with the residents, creating events that bring residents together and where they um, feel like, wow, this is a place that, that supports my lifestyle. And um, the, we came in and brought all those things, identified those things in our acquisition due diligence process and then quickly started to implement them. And what we've seen over the, roughly the last little over two years is that we've been able to increase our in-place rents 14% since we took over the asset. Um, the areas that we improve the resident experience, I think, are, are evident in the fact that we increased online reviews, you know, the Google and Yelp reviews that people leave about the property, that were basically, on average, they got about one review per month prior to ownership. We've increased that during our ownership to six per month. We'll talk a little bit later about the importance of online reviews really being critical. But it's also not only the number of views, but what people are saying about you and the rating. And so the rating scale is typically on five. Prior to ownership, the average online review score was two and a half. Um, since we took it over, um, we've, we've accumulated an average re review score of 4.2. Um, when we took over, that was the the rating was one of the worst in the comp set. Now we're the best in the comp set. And 
I think what that says is that our residents have recognized the transformation in the, in the experience that they're having, and they're active ambassadors for us now. They're one of our best marketing tools that we could have. And so those things are really critically important, and a lot of work goes into getting that right. Um, yeah, and what's, what's interesting about this, if you think about what Mark just said, at six reviews a month, that, that's over 70 a year, and that, that becomes a significant data set. That, that's a lot of data. And the online world is real. It's as real as the physical world, because if, if you don't win with high quality reviews, both a lot of them and high quality, saying that they, they like your product, um, people aren't even gonna go to your website and they're ultimately not gonna come tour, whether it's virtual or physical. And so as an owner, you're not even gonna know because the traffic will be low, that's all you'll see, right? But, but you're just not getting, you're not winning in the virtual space and it's critical, you have to. You have to invest in winning in the virtual space. Here's another interesting point. There's no way to win with online reviews unless you have a high quality product across all three areas that Mark described. So if you're sitting at home thinking about, if I wanna own or invest in a manager in multifamily real estate, uh, it's really important that that manager, or if it's you yourself, have a plan to be excellent in these three areas. And those three areas are the virtual space, the service space, and the physical space. And when you get all three right, then you start getting the reviews you want. It's actually impossible to win in the review space unless you get the frame correct and you're doing well. And that's why everything we do starts with that frame. And I'm mentioning it as three legs, but Mark, as you know, each leg has 20 subsets. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, just to just touch on the virtual world, we've, we've identified over 20 features or elements in a, in a website that are really critical to telling the story. And we're showing on the screen now an example of scrolling through one of our websites, being Fletcher. You know, you have to have high quality imagery that really sells people on sort of what, what the property's really like, what are, what are its features and elements. Um, but also more importantly, you have to describe what distinguishes it. If you've got a demographic that's um, a lot of families, you need to talk about the quality of schools. Um, you need to talk about the cool restaurants in the area that are proximate to the property, um, other retail shopping, you know, the ability to get to and from where people work. All those things are sort of important. In addition to sort of all the, the criteria that people need to know, they need easy, easy accessibility to what units you have available, what that pricing is, and also get sort of some, a video or 3D imagery of what it, that unit really, what it's like to kind of walk through that unit, to live in that unit. All those things need to happen before even somebody shows up at your door to physically tour. And certainly the last few months, this has been the only way to get leasing done. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, we didn't touch on social media. It's important to be very active in terms of social media presence. We create a lot of environment, we create an environment and also a lot of events around bringing people together, creating a neighborhood feel with our properties. And we want to publicize that on Instagram and we want our and, and Facebook and we want our residents to do that too. That's a great marketing tool, but that takes work and effort. So there's a lot that goes into the sort of the virtual presence. Mm -hmm. And Mark, you just mentioned um, events that we publicize on social media that, that show the residents um, consuming the property, right? Having events um, through the property itself. And a couple things to unpack there. Number one, that's an example of two parts of the playbook intersecting, right? You wanna win in the virtual space, that's showing these events in the virtual space, but that's also service. You're providing a service, that's another leg, right? And, and to have um, retention be where we want it, right? So that's another area back to measurement. We wanna measure that our retention rate, meaning if you rent one of our apartments, you're more likely to renew than the competitive set. Well, what's one way to make sure that you win there to provide great service? So great service is always being available with a smile, uh, work orders being done quickly. So if your dishwasher breaks, it, it's fixed quickly. Um, but then when you show up, you also ask, is there anything else we can do? Because that's unexpected. 
and yep. other uh, sites don't do that. And so now you're winning in service. And another way you do it is you provide interesting resident events. And Mark, maybe you can talk briefly about how we've had to shift those resident events and to the virtual. So here's the virtual intersecting with service, service again, again, right? Because you can't have physical events in COVID. Yeah, um, so we couldn't bring people together physically in a clubhouse. We and have um, a happy hour or a, a cooking demonstration. So we quickly switched um, to doing things um, virtually. Um, we created virtual um, cooking classes, a virtual, we had a, uh, a mixologist, and that's actually a technical title um, for the profession, um, but essentially a bartender led a cocktail making class, including signature cocktails for the community. Um, we also tried to center um, these activities during the last few months around supporting local businesses and restaurants. So we, we created um, bingo and online trivia contests where we would group residents by floor. So they would compete for, for prizes and, and gift certificates to local restaurants, um, and businesses, but also you know, bragging rights for the property. And they, the participation was really strong and we thought it was a great way to bring people together. We also centered those activities around um, first responders, first responders and, and essential workers was crisis and had, had our, our residents um, come out on their balconies during happy hours to cheer um, essential workers and first responders, not only in the property, but just in, in general in life. It was a great way sort of to allow people to have a little bit of contact, you know, from a social distance aspect, but still feel that sense of community and, um, and also have a way to kind of get together and, and a shared experience. So th those are a lot of things that where we switched that because we were doing these things regularly anyway, it was a pivot for us. It wasn't like, well, what do we do now? Oh, we can't do anything. No, we, we were able to, to pivot quickly and still provide some unique and creative ideas to bring people together. Right, because we had all the infrastructure set up. We were already yeah. doing, we had, a, we had a strong virtual platform. And so now you're just bolting it on um, to make virtual events. And, and by the way, that segues pretty well into virtual leasing. Um, we had been doing virtual leasing and we had been doing uh, leasing access to our units off hours um, when there was still physical leasing late last year, even early last year. But very quickly in March, it became critical that you had virtual leasing because it was all you had. I mean, you couldn't yeah. do guided tours anymore. And so, Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about our, our building out of that platform. We were some of the earlier adopters in that because we had the infrastructure already for both. And then how we also started um, setting up ways to both benchmark and judge how we're doing at a, an entirely new way to show assets, which is virtually. Yeah. So we had been doing um, video content and, and 3D tours on our, our websites um, for a couple of years now. And, and we recognize that those mediums not only draw in more viewers, they also show the lifestyle attractions of the property to a much better effect. And um, so when COVID hit, that became really the only game in town. We were able to pivot quickly um, and use that activity. What, what, what changed uh, for us and for everybody was that there was no physical tour. So resident may view the videos and the 3D tours and that's gonna keep them in that process. They're gonna keep focusing on our community, but they're ultimately gonna want a tour. And so what we had to pivot, which was pretty rare before COVID hit, was doing live virtual tours where one of the, um, the service associates is touring somebody through on sort of FaceTime or some other medium um, live. And that took a little bit of a practice, that took some rehearsal, um, but we're pretty proud of how our teams uh, reacted quickly, took that, uh, challenge on and, and we're really successful in, in creating and how do we know they're successful because we we secretly shop them we act as as customers we also have third parties that do that and we evaluate them on a number of criteria in terms of their ability to uh, articulate um, 
what are the advantages of living in a particular community? Um, and so, and we do that with our competition as well. So we can compare and contrast how are we doing relative to them? And some of that's objective, but we try to make it as objective as possible. Mark, you said something important earlier, which is we're trying to build a sense of community. And it's so important actually uh, to do that in order to retain and give people the experience they want. Um, I recently became a renter. Um, I was a homeowner for 25 years in Chicago. And in the last month, um, I closed on a home sale and I live downtown now. And so the, the playbook that Mark's talking about, right? Physical space, right? What is the quality of the physical aspect of the building? What is the service? What is the virtual aspect and that quality? I experienced that because I'm a you know, highly discerning, sophisticated renter. And I looked everywhere. Um, and I, there were certain things that were important to me, right? I wanted to live walkable to work. Um, I wanted to have great views near the lake, right? So that was important to me. That's physical. Um, I no longer wanted to have to handle everything, you know, because I'd done that for 25 years. I travel a lot um, for work. And so I wanted high levels of service, right? So that was important to me. And then, of course, to reach all those things, I'm experiencing the virtual. Um, and, and so, you know, and by the way, all of that is benchmarked against all the opportunities available in terms of price, because I'm, I'm also within my world sensitive to those things, too. So, so I'm a real renter. And, and it was really interesting for me to experience it from that side. Every renter is looking at it the same way, but it ultimately boils down to a feeling. And you talk about this all the time, Mark. So, so why don't you, you talk about it? it? You can have this mental checklist. I did, but it boils down to how you feel. Yeah, it's it's again experience. Um, what am I experiencing when I come to your property? What am I? What did I experience when I first looked at your website? Because you know, ninety nine percent of uh, eventual renters start online. They just don't drive by and, and get out of their car and walk up and say, oh, I'm going to do a tour. I want to live here. They start the process by um, in, in the virtual world. And if they're showing up for a tour, a physical tour at your property, it's because they've already spent time on your website. They've already been attracted to something that you've articulated there that matches the lifestyle they're working, looking for. And so it's connected emotionally with them. It's connected feel. And then when they actually physically tour, or even if they're on a FaceTime tour, like we've, we've done predominantly over the last few months and likely to continue doing a lot of, it's what's it feel like when you walk in the door? Does it feel like home? Does it feel like, wow, this is something where I feel like I can make friends and I'd love to have my friends over um, to um, share this space with me. And so that's critically important. And so and it goes beyond just first impressions and career appeal. It has to be in sort of not only as Dave, you noted, the physical. Um, and that's why we spend a lot of times reimagining common spaces, um, creating dog runs and dog pet stations, for instance. And that's not only for a convenience, it's a way for pet owners to meet. So we try to center around what we do to properties in terms of the physical changes of bringing people together, bringing ability to meet people, create a sense of community, not just have it as a convenience. So let's, let's talk about one of our um, assets as an example. Um, Anatol, which is an income plus fund. Um, I believe you have some information and some slides to share with that, but um, it also is an example. And it's an example of something that we had to manage through COVID, right? And you can yeah. talk about, you know, COVID itself and how we addressed and de-risked that asset and set it up for success. Yeah, so uh, Anatol is an asset that we acquired last um, October in uh, northwest um, suburb of Austin. And we were able to acquire this asset on an off-market basis, which um, typically means that we're a less competitive environment and that we're able to um, buy with an edge where we believe that there was a substantial edge to this property and kind of back to what I referenced earlier about Fletcher we saw a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of coming in bringing our playbook in terms of service um, resident events um, and not as much on the physical side here because this assets in really great shape relatively new asset 
um, newly constructed asset, but significant improvement in both um, service and um, its virtual presence to the world. So we made significant improvements there. And, and, but we also knew there were challenges. Going back to the acquisition process, we identified that this, the prior owner who had a huge occupancy drop when some new supply hit earlier in 2018 basically filled the building up without any credit standards, not really qualifying people whether they could afford to live there. And so we knew going in that we were likely gonna have a challenge when we started to improve the property and raise rent. And so we, we made assumptions in line with that. So we were able to predict some of that. We didn't predict COVID um, making that situation even tougher, but because we identified through our uh, analysis that that was gonna be a problem, um, we we underwrote you know specific assumptions to sort of address that. And what's interesting is our focus on on the playbook, both from a service and virtual, because those have been really the key focus focuses for this asset. We've had since we've owned it close to ninety five percent occupancy. Our comp sets performed about at ninety four percent. Now what's interesting, our retention has only been about 34% comp sets, you know, 45. But we expected that. Um, we expected a lot of attrition and turnover because we would, people that would no longer qualify for the higher rents. Um, and that really takes you back to the investment process. You have to get that right. You don't want to be surprised by something like that and say, wow, you know, no one wants to renew at these higher rents that, were, that we think that we provided value, but they don't want to pay for it. But well, we knew that, but we also knew that if we focused on our virtual um, uh, marketing efforts, that we would be able to drive new traffic to the property that could afford to live and would see the value in the things that we were providing. Um, and you know, so far our in-place rents are three percent above pro forma. And back to the de-risking. Um, right now, we're refinancing the current loan to take advantage of an opportunity in the marketplace and we're going to lower our interest costs about 1%. That's roughly 240,000 a year. And you could think about that in terms of kind of yeah. return on investment. That's like 2% return on investment. So what, what Mark means, you're correct in saying 1%, but what he really means is 20% because yeah. you're lowering it from, you know, four to low threes. That's 1%. It's also a massive percentage, right? So yes. it's a huge savings and you know, th this is a whole nother conversation. We can have another show on this, but in addition to operations, Mark's team and, and Mark himself, they also you know, manage the, the financial side, right? So do you have better debt options? Are you able to refinance? Um, because that obviously in this case, it's saving you $240,000 a year. I think we could agree that's worth your time. Um, so, so you do it and, and by the way, we like this asset for the next 10 years. So let's talk about 10 years at 240,000 savings per year. Starts that up. Um, so Anatole, we like a lot. Um, it's a good example. Um, one of the things that we should um, talk about a little bit, Mark, is the difference between renewal rents and new rents. Because one of the things that we're doing quite well is raising rents on renewals. This is across the portfolio, it's not just Anatole. Um, yeah. And on new leases in, in a market like COVID, that's more challenging, right? So it, it's hard to get new people in and you have to incent them. But if you're getting rent increases on the existing uh, renters there, because, you know, a lot of the renters are enjoying being there, number one, like people generally don't like to move if they don't have a reason. And we're making it um, very easy for them not to have a reason. And that boils down to service. I mean, if you're giving them a great experience and a feeling of community, unless they're buying a home, why would they leave, right? And, and so we're focusing very much on retention, but then also rent increases within that retention. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the trend over the last couple of years is it's, there hasn't been as significant as we've gotten long in the, this economic expansion cycle the ability to continually push new rents, there's, there's competition, there's the new supply that's come to the market. And while there's been some rent growth there, the real way to win is to focus on your existing residents, keep them. And if you deliver 
value and provide, which, which is, keeps getting more difficult because once you provide great service, it becomes expected. Now you have to figure out ways to do the unexpected and continue to wow them. But it's not fun to move. And, and if the people are happy there, they've, they've made friends there, they, you have this sense of community, and you provide a great service, they're going to likely stay unless you know they have a lifestyle change, like you noted. And so in 2019, we were able to increase where the markets were growing, you know, two to three at best overall market. We would have increased our renewal rates by five percent. And during COVID, we still had success. It's come down certainly, um, but we've still grown our renewals over this year to date and during the COVID period at 2.6 percent. And that's directly correlated to all the things that we've been talking about in terms of service and and creating a lifestyle for the people that live in our community. Yeah, and, and that's one of the ways that we're winning right now. So a lot of the questions that we get from investors are, are you having to lower rents? And, and the answer is, in some markets, yes, on new leases, but not significantly. And in no markets on existing leases. And so back to benchmarking, we're benchmarking what the industry standard is, but also what our competitive set is. And we want to make sure that if the industry standard is anywhere from, you know, 45 to 55% retention, we want to make sure with the high end of that asset by asset and as a portfolio. And then also we want to make sure that, look, you can win on retention, but if you're doing it by not increasing rents, that's not winning. Right. So we want to be winning in both places. Right. So right now we're, 2.6% in the sort of the April, May, very distressed part. But last year we were at 5% on renewals and, and we expect that to normalize and continue. And that'll be a big part of our success going forward um, because that, that flows right to the bottom line. Um, Mark, I wanna, um, I wanna shift a little bit. We're touching on COVID and I wanna be able to take uh, questions. We had some questions that were um, asked prior to this webinar and then I see that we have three. Um, if you are on and you want to um, ask a question, just touch the, uh, the Zoom feature and you'll see the Q&A feature. And you can ask any question you want. We have three questions right now thus far. Um, typically, we have a lot more than that. So please ask your questions. Um, Mark, let's talk about COVID. Um, so I would think that you would agree with this statement. Um, you've never seen a bigger shift in the market fundamentals overnight than what happened in March, correct? Yeah, no doubt about it. And so the question becomes, what do we do, right? So now it's, it's March 12th. Mike Tyson did punch us in the face, right? And so right. what do you do? And, and, you know, I was in the room with you and your team. What were the yep. decisions we made? Yeah, you know, we quickly moved to um, communication with our residents. It was was really critical to let them know that, you know, there are plans available if, if you're impacted adversely, you got laid off from your job or your economic situation has been disrupted. We can help solve that. Um, our focus was on preserving occupancy and we didn't want to see um, a huge amount of vac vacates because of people losing their jobs. So there was some flexibility around that. We also focused immediately on going out to, to renewals and having those conversations. People hadn't made a decision yet. Where does this decision lie and have flexibility around? And that's why, you know, the, the rent growth and renewals has come down because we had to be flexible. But it was a, a critical focus on occupancy. Um, we didn't have to change how we evaluate um, and approve the credit of a potential resident because we never budged on that. You know, that's really important. I talked about it. Anatole, the prior owner, really uh, dropped its standard significantly. And all that does is set you up for you know, a, a problem down the road. And so we held our standards and, and because we had discipline around that, we've had really strong collections kind of in the mid nineties, which is consistent with sort of the national average across, you know, the entire, uh, you know, portfolio of multifamily assets in the country. And it's because we haven't changed those standards, but we also effectively communicated with our residents. And then additionally, you know, a lot of the amenities just got shut down for safety reasons. And so we talked earlier about how we pivoted to make sure that, especially while people are all home all day, that we can improve that experience and, and, uh, for them and, 
by creating sort of these virtual to get togethers um, and uh, other ways to sort of uh, break the monotony and, and bring people together is really critical to sort of success. And I think it'll continue to pay off as people sort of remember what it was like. If they were miserable over the last few months, they're not likely to stay because they'll find blame in what we, we did or didn't do. I think the things that we did allow people to say, wow, you know what, the experience was tough, but, but I'm happy I was living here during that. So with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna shift to questions. Um, we had quite a few questions that were asked prior, and I see that we have some questions now. Um, I'll start, Mark, um, and I'll ask, you, I'll ask you the first few questions, and maybe I'll, I'll answer uh, the ones that are live. Okay. So remember, you have to be brief. This is uh, Origin Take 5. This is, uh, you have to answer it in 15 seconds, all right? Okay. The department buzzword has been amenities for a while now. How have those offerings fared during COVID, and do you think it will change going forward? Yeah, we talked already about how we um, replaced our 24-7 fitness centers with on-demand home workouts and the social gatherings and Zoom and balcony parties that we talked about. Um, you know, the precautions that residents take in terms of getting back to amenities may may last for a while, um, but and we may see a lot of residents continue to work from home for some time. But the, the keys there for us in terms of um, our amenities are you got to have really great Wi-Fi, great internet. And now what we've recognized is you got to have better bandwidth for video conferencing, not necessarily something that was in huge demand before that might be, might be now. Um, but, you know, our residents are going to want access to green space and, and gyms. And those are things that we're, we're focused on making um, those spaces, not only getting them back open, but long-term creating a way that people can use them without sort of any, any, any risk. Yeah. And one of the things that we um, launched actually a year ago, but we're continuing to do, it's called operation surprise and delight. Um, that's yeah. not just service orders. That's also physical space. So if you sign a lease with us and, you know, four or five months into the lease, um, we'll come in and perhaps we'll um, upgrade your closet because um, that's very important um, to, to residents. But they don't expect it. Um, we're not increasing their rent either. We will when they renew. But at this point, we're not. And so we're improving their unit. That's an asset to us. But we're also creating a lot of goodwill with them. Um, some other things we're talking about now is as part of Operation Surprise and Delight, we will um, come in and, and build them out or buy them a desk feature. Uh, because working from home has become so important, right? So Mark's absolutely right. You, you have to win in bandwidth um, and internet. It's, it's probably right below water in terms of what people need to survive at this point um, and what they value. So we make sure that we're at the top end there. But beyond that, we need to create spaces where they can work. Um, you know, and oftentimes, if you're in a thousand square foot apartment or even 800 or 600 square foot apartment, every single square foot needs to be well thought of. And now that you're working from there and living, it needs to be even more well thought of, right? So we spend yeah. a lot of time on, on those elements. Um, I'm gonna move on. Um, next question is, um, would you be willing to share some of the checklist you have when selecting multifamily assets based on your criteria, such as school ratings, income level, affordability, transportation, shopping, ownership of homes in the area, Yeah, I mean, we, we, can, we can talk to that, and we have, they're, they're very detailed lists, and, and through, you know, our process involves not only collaboration amongst our teams, but we bring in um, other third parties to help us analyze both physical and operational aspects that either need improvement or that could be potential risks that we have to find mitigants for. So it's a fairly extensive. Um, we don't have time on this call to kind of go through every aspect, but in, in the question, they touched on sort of the major things that we, some of the major things that we do. Yeah. The, we look at walkability scores and a lot of what this question is about is how walkable, you know, and so whether it's urban or suburban, that's not as important to us as is it walkable? Can, can you walk to the things that you need to do? The grocery store, Starbucks, 
experiential retail, things like that. And, and that's obviously something that's measured, which we like. Um, so it's not necessarily just subjective, it's measured. Um, the other things that we um, are doing right now, and we're, we're very late into this process now, um, months and months and months and, and hundreds of hours have been invested in this is, we're creating artificial intelligence models that help quantify what this uh, person is talking about. And so when we're looking at the investable universe, our artificial intelligence models can actually um, help provide objective screens to what we're looking at. And this is on the value side, but on the, on the price side um, will be cap rates, price per pound, price in general, et cetera. And so we, it really helps us because at the end of the day, we only have our time. And right now we are looking at over a thousand deals a year. I'd like to make that 3000, but you have to work smart in order to, to keep expanding that um, opportunity set. Um, the, a question here about our QOZ and income plus funds. And it's really about um, our retention rate and across these portfolios. So, I would expand it, Mark, across uh, our fund two, fund three, income plus fund, and QZ. What is our retention rate and what are our um, payment rates? And I assume he's saying how many of our renters are paying rent. Yeah, really across the, the entire multifamily portfolio. Our retention has been very strong. It's been, you know, at or above 50% through, you know, if you're looking back, sort of March through, through May, the, the period where COVID really hit. And during that time, um, our collections have been, you know, anywhere between um, 94 to 95%. We did have a dip in April down below 92%. And that was related to some short-term stay operators um, that, you know, they signed mastered leases for a number of units and then leased them out for like hotels, similar to the sort of Airbnb concept. Um, a couple of those, we've been very careful about that strategy of, of not um, um, putting a lot of those leases into our properties, but a, a couple of leases we had inherited that were already in place and, and continued. And, and those had uh, gotten hammered um, by COVID disruption and many of those businesses had closed. Um, so that, that took us down a little more in April. Um, the balance that we haven't collected are people on payment plans where they were paying something. So we have a very few people who aren't paying anything. They typically are paying 50, 60% of their rent with a promise to, to catch up here shortly. Um, and so, so far, um, pretty manageable um, for us. We're still not out of the woods. You know, we start worrying when some of the, some of the financial um, in, um, things that the, uh, both the Fed and the, uh, federal government have done start to start to fade off, but we're certainly encouraged by you know the job growth reports last week, and you know this is something we'll continue to monitor and, and manage. Yeah, that segues in. I'm going to move the live questions, but that segues well into the last. I just received this question. Um, you said, "How have rent collections in June compared with April and May? Um, are you worried that there could be collection issues once the government stimulus?" wears off, which um, I believe is at the end of July is when the unemployment um, part of it either has to be renewed or that stops. Um, I can answer that. Um, in terms of June collections, um, even though rent is due technically the first of the month, they actually tend to come in the first 10 days of the month. Um, Mark, do we have data on June that's um, complete enough that we can start to share it? Yeah, it's it's still very early. We've collected about a little over 80% of those rents, which is consistent with what we saw in the last few months at this period of time, and consistent with the data on a national basis. So that doesn't concern us yet, as Dave noted. Rents do start to come in, and especially during this period, have come in a little bit later. People uh, have paid a little bit later, but ultimately, back once we get kind of another another week or so into the month, we'll get you know, close to that 95%. So we don't know that for sure in June, but we at least don't see anything so far in the month that suggests that it's going to be any different. And in terms of the second question, um, 
you know, yeah, if the unemployment, that's a big piece of the government stimulus. And so if they didn't extend that at the same time that the economy stayed at plus or minus 13 to 15% unemployment, of course, that becomes um, something you're concerned about. I, I don't personally, I mean, this is my opinion, not necessarily even origins. Um, I don't think that they won't extend that if unemployment stays 13 to 15%. I, I think they're going to have to extend. Um, that's not a political statement. I, that's just my opinion. Um, but in the event that they didn't and unemployment stayed very high, that would be a concern of mine too. And what we would do to mitigate that is essentially everything we've done, which is focus on delivering a great product, a great service, a great experience, um, so that people value paying their rent and staying in good standing with us. That's happened thus far. Um, there's really nothing else we can do other than we didn't use a lot of leverage when we bought these properties. So we have lots of cushion in terms of our ability to service debt, um, even in the event that that happened, right? So those are decisions that were made long before COVID. They've been made for the last 10 years um, at origin. Yeah. Um, next question, uh, single family rentals are an asset class uh, that are interesting right now and has a demographic, demographic tailwind behind it. Is this something that we're looking to do in terms of our own investing? Um, I can answer that, Mark, you know, because it's more on the acquisition side, but I, um, we've looked at uh, single family rentals for the last three to four years. Um, we've tried to participate in the PREF equity space, which essentially is a, a more protected subclass of equity that is, um, sits above the common as not first loss. Um, in both instances, we came close, but weren't awarded um, the deals. Um, those deals wound up doing quite well. I, I agree that um, it's an interesting space um, because people are tending to not buy as much, but they might wanna move into sort of a more horizontal living strategy where they have a small backyard, but it's still a rental. Um, and so the answer is we're looking at it. Um, we agree that this has interesting demographics. Um, it all boils down to expected value. So it, it's in our purview and we're looking at it. Um, and I don't disagree with your opinion that it's an interesting um, subset of multifamily right now. Um, I'm gonna move on. There's a question about retail and um, specifically um, they're talking about Gap. You know, Gap is in a lawsuit because they're refusing to pay rent. Um, their landlords are saying, look, you're a publicly traded company, you have money, pay the rent. Um, and, you know, Gap is saying that there's um, either implicit or stated parts of the lease that say this is sort of a five standard deviation event and therefore we don't need to pay our rent. And that's kind of where it's being argued. Um, we're not really, I mean, we don't really invest in retail, but some of our buildings have retail because um, multifamily buildings and urban spaces oftentimes have retail on the ground floor, that's because the cities require it. Um, they want sales tax revenue, and so they require us to include it. Um, and so in certain instances, we, we do have retail tenants, and so we're part of this conversation as well. Um, Mark, why don't you, we're not in these sorts of conversations uh, where they're talking about force majeure, et cetera, but yeah. um, we do have a process um, to deal with both renters and retail if they request relief. And so why don't, why don't you take us through those? Yeah, yeah, certainly. The, the, our leases are, are pretty clear that um, this isn't a force majeure event. So we haven't had to have that battle that's, that's uh, being well publicized. Um, but in terms of, as Dave mentioned, we do have some retail, but our whole, it's less than a half a percent of our entire commercial portfolio really adds up. And we have had to engage with some of those tenants in terms of providing uh, rent relief. And when I say rent relief, that's more of a deferral that they'll pay something in, uh, let's say May and June, and then there's a payback mechanism. And so in the near term, so they're really kind of on a case by case basis with our commercial tenants. We look at their situation. Is this a tenant that we want to see it make through, have they done, taken steps to help themselves 
the PPP program, other um, avenues that they can pursue to, to ensure the survival of their business. But we recognize that, that especially retail tenants were, were severely impacted by this and that we needed to do something. But um, the steps that we've taken, and we hadn't had to do this with every tenant, but are, are more of a, a deferral with a near-term payback. And um, really, I, I kind of would describe it as just flexibility. Yeah. Last question, I'm determined to keep us on time. It's 1.58. Um, how do you feel about medium and long-term prospects of class A multi versus class B? Yes. And, and just to define uh, class A, it's a designation. Class B is a designation. If you don't know, class A tends to it be, tends to be. Um, newer, um, higher quality, higher rents, generally in urban, but also suburban infill locations. And I also um, classify class A as in cities that are um, large enough to have a deep liquid market, right? So if you put a great building in a tiny city, in my opinion, it's not class A anymore, even though it's a great building because it, it's this illiquid area, um, if you will. Um, I will tell you, there's a lot of different definitions. Um, class B would be, um, you know, a lesser quality asset, um, maybe in construction, maybe in location, maybe in credit quality, um, maybe in the city size itself. Um, and so what do I think is going to do better? Um, I don't really have an opinion on that, to be honest with you. I, I, we, we tend to invest in class A and class A minus. Um, that's our asset quality. And we define it more by the renter. Um, we want renters by choice, not renters by necessity. So, you know, people that they could rent, they could own, but they choose to rent and they tend to be college educated. They tend to be higher credit quality. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to get a higher return. It, it does mean that we believe the risk adjusted return is probably higher. Um, you're not going to see um, people that are renters by choice. Um, they really value their credit rating. Um, they don't want to default on a lease. Um, that, that's not, that's important to them. Right. Um, and so th that's, that's my opinion on it, Mark. I don't know if you want to add to that, but I don't have an opinion on what will quote outperform. I, I believe that class A is safer. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is that that renter by choice, that allows you to, you know, execute a lot of the elements of our playbook to get a return on those investment that we need to make, whether that be time or capital to improve yeah. the physical building. If if you have a resident who's sort of at sort of the max affordability putting more money and time and, and improvement in service, you're not going to see a return on it. So that's, that's really critical to having playbook work. Yeah, that's a great point because back to measurement, if, if you're, if you're underwriting as a do it yourself investor, focus on affordability, right? So the way you do that is the median income of the people renting at the asset versus the rents. And, and you really don't want um, that ratio to be above 30%. Right. So if their rent is more than 30 percent of their gross income, you really don't have abilities, um, grid abilities to raise rent. And to Mark's point, even if you increase quality. Right. So if you redo the clubhouse, if you increase the virtual, the physical the service, the playbook, that renter doesn't have the ability to, to, to pay more anyway. Right. So whether you're in class A or class B, you should be looking really hard at affordability within your renter group um, because that'll that'll show you a lot. You know, conversely, if it's sub 20%, you've got room to run. You know, you, you have room that if you increase quality and service, you can raise rents and they should be able to pay those higher rents. Um, I am out of time. Um, if we didn't address your question, um, we're happy to address questions um, offline. Um, all of our email, by the way, at Origin is available on the website. So if you have a question, shoot us a note and, and we'll answer it. Or if you feel like a question wasn't answered um, clearly enough um, today, um, thank you for your time. Um, longer term or even medium term, we're a big believer in multifamily, mainly because um, for the last 25 years, it's been a wonderful investment um, with very little standard deviation, meaning um, over time it goes up in value, provides dividends and long-term appreciation. Um, we don't believe that's going to change. Um, and so we're 
we're very confident um, in our portfolios and our ability to create value for us and you. Um, be safe. Uh, we will talk soon and uh, hopefully you enjoyed the hour together. Mark, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone.